excited to be here to speak about front-end platform engineering with you. Um, so I've been a front-end platform engineer, I would say, for at least the last 10 years. And I have to be honest that we've kind of felt a little like, I don't know, nobody knows what to do with us, <laughs> right? Like, uh, you know, we, we tend to own bits and pieces of infrastructure, but we didn't really fit in very well with DevOps or SRE. We often own large parts of the product code base, but we aren't product engineers. So I don't, I don't know, we've never really fit in anywhere, and it, I'm really excited to be here because it feels like we're getting a seat at the cool kids table, finally. <laughs> and like, I, I found my people. <laughs> so, um, is this wrong button? Oh, okay. I'll just use that. Um, <laughs> so since we're here together for the first time and we're all just learning about each other, um, when I was preparing this talk, I chatted with folks that I know that are more like DevOps, SRE, backend -y. They don't work on the front end, right? So I wanted to get a sense of like, what do you think about the front end? And a few different themes emerged from those discussions. What I heard from folks overwhelmingly is that the front end feels like it's super complicated for no reason. <laughs> um, the tech changes super rapidly. There's approximately 5,000 different libraries and tools and patterns out there, and new ones come out every day, so we don't know how to keep up. I heard a lot about how HTML and JavaScript, and especially CSS, are really frustrating to work with. So how many of you kind of feel this way? And it's okay, we're friends here. You can raise your hand. Yeah, <laughs> all right. So my hope for today is that I'm gonna change all of your minds about the needless part, right? Um, because that really bothered me when I heard that. My, I wrote this down in my notebook and I put like exclamation points after it. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe they said this to me. Um, so we're gonna talk through some of the really hard problems that front end platform teams need to understand and solve in order to give you like a high level framework that's gonna help you cut through all of that noise of like the hot new framework of the month club and allow you to reason about the complex world of front end engineering. And the reason why I think that it's important that we all talk about this is because our job as platform engineers is the same no matter what kind of platform we're building for. We need to deeply understand and manage the underlying complexities of all the systems that we're building on top of so that other engineers, our customers, don't have to. Right? Sarah said something this morning about how it's our job to build those abstraction layers that help other engineers move faster. We weigh the trade-offs so that individual engineers don't have to. And I think that this is especially important on the front end because front end platform teams are in this unique situation where we actually have two customers. Right? First, the engineers who are building our product and they use all of the tools and the services and things that we write, but we also have this second order customer of the actual users of our websites and web apps. And in an ideal world, we would never give engineers tools that are gonna be like really terrible for UX and vice versa. We don't wanna make decisions that are great for the user experience, but make it harder to ship features. And now this, this, right, that seems like a no-brainer, like, yeah, duh, right? But <laughs> in reality, this tension between the needs of engineers and the needs of users can be really hard to balance and navigate. And I swear, Matt and I did not um, coordinate on our iceberg metaphors. <laughs> I actually, I gave this in an internal talk um, a couple years ago, and I love it. So it's what I call the, the iceberg metaphor of front-end architecture. So above the water is what we kind of traditionally think of as like the front end, so AKA the user experience. The HTML, the CSS, the JavaScript that are the fundamental building blocks of the web, all of your client side frameworks and libraries, plus you have to make sure that your front end is secure and performant and accessible and maybe you care about SEO. However, that is just the tip of the iceberg. Under the surface, there's a whole bunch of complexity. All of the systems and choices that we make in order to better support the developer experience, all of which actually have a massive impact on our users. How you decide to architect your design system or do dependency management or run experiments or build and deploy assets, all of those have just as much of an impact on your end users as the client-side JavaScript libraries that you use. So your front-end architecture is like this whole entire iceberg. So we want to avoid a titanic-sized crash into this iceberg of front-end complexity, right? <laughs> so we're going to learn more about it. Um, we're going to start by developing a better understanding of why the front-end is so dang complicated. Where does all this complexity come from? What are the hard problems in front-end? 
And then we're gonna talk about the different ways historically that we've tried to solve them. Then we're gonna move on and kind of talk about how we navigate all of that complexity, particularly through the lens of your front end platform. Okay, so what are the really hard problems and constraints that make web development and especially front end platform development hard? Um, I'm gonna talk about nine, there's a lot more than nine, <laughs> but I had to kind of narrow it down to something. Um, but I think that a lot of these are like the, the hardest and the most important things that your platform should be abstracting away for you. So that's why I picked these. And the first constraint we have to deal with <laughs> is HTML and CSS and JavaScript, <laughs> right? <laughs> the design of the World Wide Web itself. Now, the web was not originally designed to be an application framework, right? This is what the original website that was made in 1991 looked like. You can go look at it today. As you can see, it's just a bunch of text and some links. There's no images, there's no multimedia. Um, there's, you know, all there is is static information. HTML was designed to basically mark up term papers so that academics could share them with each other. And obviously we've augmented the design. You know, we have images now, we have CSS, and we have JavaScript. Um, but it's like a true testament to the brilliance of the web that the same tech that made this happen powers all of our modern interactive experiences. So what do you need to make a website? Well, you need a web server that's connected to the internet, a web browser client, you need some HTML that defines the structure of your page, CSS to style the content, and then JavaScript to add interactivity, right? I think the important thing for all of us to think about is the fact that like all three of these languages are uncompiled static text files. You, do build, you don't build a binary and ship it to a web browser. It's uncompiled static text files. Anyone can open up their favorite editor and type some words and symbols and then FTP them up to a web server and you have a front end platform and I'm done, thank you, I'll see you next year. No, <laughs> but like FTPing static files to a server doesn't scale, right? <laughs> so in order to scale beyond FTPing static files, we had to start creating all of these abstraction layers that would allow us to use other languages that would then generate those static HTML and CSS and JavaScript files that we could return to browsers inside of an HTTP response. In order to do things like reuse code, get dynamic data, run tests, run CI, CD, all of these things, we had to create abstractions on top of the core technology of the web. And over time, as the way that we've used the web has changed, we've had to change our abstractions to keep up. And that's why there's so many different ways to do things, and we're gonna talk a lot more about these abstractions historically in a little bit. All right, the next constraint that we have to deal with is the fact that the web is not owned by any individual company or browser manufacturers. There's a standards body, um, the W3C, or the World Wide Web Consortium, or uh, TC39, which is the ECMA International JavaScript Standard Body. Um, so the process for adopting new standards is designed around consensus building. And anytime you're trying to build consensus, that means that the pace of change is going to be very slow. Everyone has to come together and agree on what the right APIs to build are and how they should be designed. And then individual companies can choose or not choose to go off and implement the standards. So a lot of the complexity has arisen over time because engineers and designers are zooming ahead of the standards and they're solving problems before the standards and the browser implementations can catch up. Right, jQuery, why was jQuery so dang successful? jQuery took all of these low level JavaScript APIs that had different definitions and different API signatures in different browsers and it created this really easy to use abstraction layer on top of that that allowed engineers to just write the same code and execute it everywhere and not think about all of those differences cross browser. So like, you know, in the case of jQuery, jQuery zoomed ahead, but then what happened is standards bodies learned from the lessons of jQuery's success, and now a lot of those solutions are, based, are baked into the specs. So jQuery, as much as I love it, I could talk about jQuery all day, um, but jQuery's obsolete now, right? And it's because the standards process learned from what jQuery was doing, and that cycle is gonna continue. All right, the third hard problem, which should have been the first hard problem, but 
I felt like it flowed better the other way, um, <laughs> is that when it comes to the web, users come first, right? With great power comes great responsibility. We have to protect user privacy and security, and we have to ensure that the web is accessible to everyone. I really love how the W3C's newly released um, web platform design principles talks about this. It calls it the priority of constituencies. So user needs come before the needs of web page authors, which is like me, us, um, <laughs> which comes before the needs of user agent implementers, which come before the needs of specification writers, which come before theoretical purity. And I love that theoretical purity is in there because it feels like a real subtweet. Like somebody was like, oh, theoretical purity. And they were like, nope, that's last. Um, <laughs> so so I'm a, actually, I'm on the W3C web performance working group. So I'm helping to like create the standards and the specifications for the future of web performance. And it's been really fascinating to me the number of times that I am just like, let's expose that timing data. I just want to know, like, how long did it take for this JavaScript to load? Did it come out of the cache? Did it not come out of the cache? But we actually can't know that because that could be a vector for someone to get information about someone, you know, what, some, what websites someone has been to before. So, you know, no, the answer is no. Like, as a, as a web, you know, web, I don't know, <laughs> as somebody who writes code that tracks performance of websites, that's frustrating as heck to me. But as a user of the web, I'm really reassured by the fact that like our needs come first. Okay, the fourth constraint, which I think is really like, like the biggest difference between front end platforms and other kinds of platform engineering is that the browser is a code execution environment that you have no control over whatsoever. I'll let that sink in. I'm gonna drink my water and you're gonna sink in. So you write a bunch of HTML and CSS and JavaScript and you send it off. And from there your code runs on other people's computers. And not like the cloud, but like some ancient laptop that's running IE6, right? This is bananas <laughs> when you think about it. <laughs> I am so jealous of all the people who are like setting up Kubernetes clusters because you get to control everything about where your code executes. You know exactly what OS is running. You know the version of the OS. You know what the CPU is like. You know what the RAM is like. You push a button and you set the CPU the way you want it to be. On the web, it could be anything. Websites are accessible via like pretty much any device these days, smartphones, smartwatches, laptops, desktops, TVs, refrigerators have freaking web browsers in them now. <laughs> Video game consoles, if you could stop playing Tears of the Kingdom for like five minutes, you could actually pull up the web on your Switch. Isn't that like, it's like wild. So, so we don't control any of that. <laughs> we, you know, we don't control how big the screen is. We don't control how the user's interacting with the code. You know, maybe there isn't even a screen because they're using a braille display. Um, we don't know if they're using a mouse. We don't know if they're using a touch screen. We don't know, you know, maybe they're using neither of those because they have a physical disability and they're using a switch mechanism, right? Um, this is why CSS is a declarative language. CSS is actually, in fact, awesome. <laughs> I, you know, like, like there's a great blog post that um, Jim Nielsen wrote, and actually, I, I'm gonna have a link at the end that's gonna link out to all the things I'm talking about. But, um, you know, CSS was designed to manage this lack of control using a declarative language. So I want all of us after today to leave this room and every time somebody complains about CSS, you say, actually, CSS is really well designed to solve the problems that it's solving, right? Agreed? Cool. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> the next big foundational problem that we have to manage is that the web is designed to be backwards compatible. And what that means for us is that our code has to account for the last 20 plus years of technology, all different browsers running on different operating systems and different devices. And um, the long tail of browsers is really, really long, right? So the site whatismybrowser.com has over 219 million 219 million unique user agent strings in their database. And every single one of those represents a unique combination of factors. Different browsers, different devices, different capabilities of those devices, different rendering engines in the browser, different JavaScript engines, maybe different implementations of APIs, different levels of API support, historical versions of APIs plus modern versions of APIs. 
Um, so there's so much complexity inherent in managing all of this backwards compatibility. And the next kind of big foundational constraint is that you know, you have to deal with all these combinations, but you don't actually know what combination you're dealing with in advance. And that's because, as Scott Hanselman so very aptly puts it, um, lies, damned lies, and user agents. <laughs> Those 219 million strings don't actually tell you anything useful that you can trust. They're supposed to be this identifier, but actually what they are is like a bunch of random gibberish um, that is perfectly easy to spoof. Like spoofing a user agent is the easiest thing to do in the world. And for browser, like for privacy reasons, um, browser manufacturers are actually now starting to freeze user agents and send you less information because it's a vector for fingerprinting. So what this means we have to do is that you don't know the capabilities or what G, uh, JavaScript APIs or CSS features are supported until you actually get your code into the browser and check to see if the new hotness is supported. Right? This is very unusual, I think, that a lot of other platforms don't have to deal with this. So like, you don't know the, the boundaries of the execution environment until you get code executing in the execution environment. Right? <laughs> like, and then you have to write a fallback. If it's not supported, what do you do? Maybe you do nothing. Maybe you're just like, man, whatever. It's too cool for my users, I guess. Um, <laughs> all right, another thing that you can't trust is the network. Um, there's a whole other class of design decisions on the web that are ways to work around unreliable network connections. And that's really because every request that you make is another opportunity for failure. Either you run the risk of a slower connection that slows down the user experience and the user has a bad time, or you run the risk of losing connectivity in the middle of a session. So to help alleviate the need for web browsers to go back over the network and re-request every file, there's a cache in the browser that stores your assets for you. But now we have a new problem, and it's one of the two hardest problems in computer science, right? Cache invalidation, naming things, and off by one errors. Yeah, <laughs> I love that joke, I'm sorry. I'm glad somebody laughed. <laughs> so, man managing the browser's cache effectively is actually one of the hardest things that your front-end platform has to do for you, right? And there's APIs that help out with this, but like, you do not want your product engineers to have to think every day when they write code, how do I invalidate the browser cache? You have to do it for them. All right, and the next constraint is one of my personal favorites, which is that browsers are single-threaded. Now, this has a little asterisk there, because I need to caveat this, and I don't want to be told, well, actually. Um, but <laughs> modern, modern browsers have multiple processes and multiple threads running, and there are threads outside of the browser's main thread that do things like networking, and newer browsers have a, like, some things that they hand off to be multi-threaded. But, um, to understand a little bit more about what I mean when I talk about why it's so important that web browsers are single-threaded, um, we're gonna have a crash course in how browsers work. Now, I gave a talk a couple years ago called Happy Browser, Happy User that goes really, really, really in depth into this. So I'll have the link at the end. If you're interested, you can go watch it. But um, so let's walk through the classic, like what happens when I type a URL into my browser interview problem. So I enter my browser, or my URL. Um, the browser makes an HTTP request back to my server. There's a lot of stuff that happens with DNS and TCP and all of that, ACK and SYN, whatever. Um, but my server returns the HTTP response index.html. And what the browser does is it starts to parse that file into the document object model or the DOM tree. Remember, it's an uncompiled static text file. So it has to turn it into this in-memory representation tree structure that represents the HTML document. Now, as the parser has gone through and parsed my HTML, it encounters links to JavaScript and CSS, so it goes over the network to make HTTP requests for those. Now, CSS is a higher priority, so it gets requested first and it comes back first. The browser gets to work parsing all that CSS into another tree called the CSS OM, or the CSS object model. It's another tree structure, but what it does is it basically takes all of the style rules that you defined in your CSS, plus the browser default styling, plus users can um, have their own custom CSS, mushes them all together. And then the reason why um, CSS is so important is because once the browser has both the DOM and the CSS on, it can combine them together into another tree called the render tree, 
which it uses to first lay out the screen as a bunch of boxes and then paint pixels to the screen. So that's how we show something to users is we need the DOM and the CSS DOM and then party user sees something. So let's talk about JavaScript. Well, that comes back over the wire. And again, it gets parsed into another tree. Right? Browsers love trees. <laughs> um, this one is called the JavaScript AST. Um, and this is going to be super hand wavy. I'm going to have links to some talks from other people that go in more detail. But um, basically, the JS AST gets compiled into machine code. The browser executes the code. And then it kicks off um, this JavaScript runtime event loop pattern which is like this asynchronous message queue that just constantly runs in the background. Now when something happens, say when the user like taps on a screen, they're opening a login overlay. That action generates an event that gets put onto the event loop and any event handler code that's listening for that event gets executed. Now that handler code then modifies the DOM tree directly, which kicks off this re-rendering of the render tree, re-layout and repaint of all of the pixels onto the screen. All right, so out of curiosity, how many of you already knew this? Nice, good. So some people learned something. <laughs> All right, so the, the reason why I wanted us to really understand that is because of the fact that the browser is single-threaded means that every single one of these things is happening on one thread. Um, and this is so important to, when you think about performance and architecting for the web. If the main thread is busy downloading and parsing and executing three megabytes, megabytes of JavaScript, and your user in the meanwhile is trying to scroll the page, right? the main thread is not going to be able to respond to the user in time. You have to animate, a, to get a smooth scrolling experience, we have to animate 60 frames per second. And if the browser is busy doing other stuff, it can't animate, it's gonna drop frames and you're gonna have a janky, crappy experience, right? So, and again, browsers are, browser manufacturers are very smart. There are some things that are handled off the, off the main thread, like GPU compositing. But like, your front end platform teams really need to understand this. I don't think we do a good job of this as an industry, teaching people about this fact. Um, but you have to be able to build around that, right? All right, so our last hard problem under discussion today is observability. Ooh, observability is hard in the front end. <laughs> when you take into account all the other things that we already talked about, like you don't own the execution environment, unreliable network connections, user privacy means that the user can just completely turn off all of your ability to collect telemetry. Um, but there's also this other phenomenon from physics called the observer problem, or as I like to call it, Schrodinger's JavaScript. So, so in order to monitor the health of your website that's probably executing a whole bunch of JavaScript, you have to write more JavaScript that also gets executed on the same main thread as all of the code that's actually making your website work, right? So if you aren't careful, trying to observe the system can actually radically change the behavior of the system itself. If you add too much JavaScript to try to do performance monitoring, you're going to make the site slower. So this is a problem. I mean, I, I, my, one of my main jobs is performance monitoring, and this is a huge problem that we have to work around. Um, there's a couple of links that I've included to stuff that we're doing on the WebPerf co um, committee to try to like help alleviate that. But cool. Okay, so. To wrap up our discussion of why the front end is so complicated, we're gonna address the elephant in the room, namely all of those millions of different frameworks and libraries that feel so overwhelming to keep up with. And I think it's useful to look at this problem through a historical lens or what I call the client server pendulum. So back in the dawn of time, like 20 something years ago when I first started making websites, everyone did it pretty much the same way, right? You rendered multi-page apps on the server, um, you generate your HTML response with like a server-side language like PHP or .NET Framework or Cold Fusion. Cold Fusion keeps come on. Cold Fusion was the bomb. No. Um, <laughs> all right, and then you'd layer on a little bit of CSS to make it look nice, and then you'd use jQuery or Scriptaculous or Moo tools to do that sweet DHTML interactivity. Um, maybe if you want to go really wild, you would AJAX load parts of the page. 
But <laughs> at that time, really, anytime you wanted to update or change the contents of what is on the screen, you had to make a network request. And at the time, network requests were actually really, really slow. So that resulted in a bad user experience. Every time you want to change something on screen, having to go all the way over the network was bad. So the pendulum swung. And in order to help develop better experiences for web apps, we started using the single page application pattern, frameworks like React, right? What that does is instead of sending your HTML in your initial payload, you send this big JavaScript bundle. And your big JavaScript bundle has to execute and um, then it modifies the DOM tree directly in memory in order to make pixels appear on screen. So we made this trade-off where we slowed down the initial load of pages, but it made the experience of staying on a site and interacting with it way better because you're not going over the network for HTML. It's all there in the client for you. But over time, you know, uh, especially as React got really, really popular, people started using React for everything. And <laughs> I get it, right? It's a better developer experience. But when you're using React to render a product page or a blog article or something that's not a long-running interaction, the performance cost of waiting for all that JavaScript before you can see anything makes a pretty bad user experience. So in the last few years, the pendulum's kind of swung a little into the middle here. Networks are faster now, but with the growing prevalence of low-powered mobile devices, especially in emerging markets, the biggest bottleneck is now the CPU of the user's device. So these new kind of patterns and frameworks have, arid, uh, have arisen that are like a best of both worlds mix of both of the prior approaches. So your initial view is rendered using JavaScript on the server, um, SSR it's called, server-side rendering. That same JavaScript then gets sent to the client where it's hydrated, e.g. Um, it kind of takes over the interactivity. So you can have it be the whole page, you can have it be component islands, so like little islands of interactivity on your page. Um, and the thing is, is like all of these are still totally valid ways to build a website in 2023. At Etsy, we actually use all three of these, different, different parts and pieces for different experiences. And the number of options is actually growing, like static site generation, where you generate static HTML at build time, and you serve that from a CDN, like lightning fast, right? Edge side rendering. Um, oh gosh, I'm, I'm totally blanking on her name, but she just gave a really, from Netlify, she just gave a really good talk about um, edge side rendering. Um, you should go back and watch it if you didn't. And now I said I wasn't gonna get in the weeds of all the different frameworks, but, um, and please don't well actually me on these if you're front end, like this is hard because the, the boundaries are blurry. But like this is why there are so many ways to do things. If you, if you put all the different options in context like this, it's not the same problem that we're solving over and over again, just using slightly different methods. All of these different libraries are solving different problems in different ways. This is why there are so many options. All right, so now that we've talked a whole heck of a lot about the problems and constraints and all the options, let's talk about how we can try to navigate all of this complexity. And I'm gonna start off with some very, four very high level approaches that you should be thinking about and that your platform teams should be thinking about. And the first thing you need to do is put users first, right? We should, all of us need to do that. I mean, without our users, none of us would have a job. So put your users first, establish UX principles. Now, why does this matter? Well, if you're trying to make a decision between a bunch of like valid alternatives, if you have a core set of UX principles to fall back on, that's gonna help you to make a decision between different alternative options. Like which of these choices is gonna align with our UX goals? And if you're interested in, a, in establishing UX principles, I very much love um, Scott Gell's Aspire principles. A, because I love a good acronym, <laughs> and B, I love that it's aspirational, right? Because pragmatically, none of us are gonna be perfect. It, we're not gonna be able to make a perfect website, but good websites aspire to be accessible to users with different abilities and disabilities. You know, we want to be secure and reliable. We want to be performant on a wide range of devices and in unreliable network conditions. We want to be inclusive to diverse audiences. We want to be responsive in adapting to all those different screen sizes. And we want to be ethical in how we handle user privacy and security. And we want to be ethical about the impact that we have on the planet. And 
you know, the other reason why you really have to establish these first is because I could tell you, trying to bolt these things on later is going to fail. It's going to be an expensive failure if you're trying to make your site or your app fast when you didn't design that in from the beginning. So like start with these goals and then you're gonna have like a better time and it's gonna cost you less money. All right, the next big strategy is to be like Elsa and let it go, right? Let go of the need to control every detail because ironically, the less that you try and control every detail, the more resilient your website or your web app is going to be. I love this quote from Steph Eccles because it really kind of gets at the heart, right? Using adaptive lay layout techniques is a trust exercise between designers, developers, and the browser. Now, Steph is talking specifically here about giving up the idea of like pixel perfect layouts. Um, but this idea of writing code that works with the browser, that trusts the browser to do the right thing is applicable to all the different ways that we have to design within those constraints that we talked about, right? Backwards compatibility relies on trust. The next foundational thing that we can do to team complexity is to be more like our users. Now, what do I mean by that? Well. All of us in this room here are in a privileged minority of people who have high-powered modern devices and fast, stable, reliable network connections. The way that we experience the web is very different than the experience of most of our users. When we're making websites and we're testing them, we're sitting at our desks on fast connections and high-speed computers. We're not standing on a crowded subway train with spotty network service. Now this chart is from Alex Russell's talk um, that he gave at performance.nowconf last year, the global baseline in 2022. So this is a historical graph of Geekbench scores that rate the CPU performance of high-end versus middle of the road versus lower-end devices. So like, what's really interesting is like 10 years ago, there wasn't a huge difference, and over time, the split has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. Right, so like the, that top line, that's my Apple smartphone, the very top, versus the orange line, which actually represents the vast majority of smartphones that are being sold today, is three to four times different. So we experience a web that's three to four times faster than someone who's on a low end or a middle of the road device. So if you are not thinking about performance, if you're not testing performance on lower end devices, then you're missing out on, on opportunities for your business because your users probably aren't experiencing the web that way. All right, um, and my last thing I wanna uh, kind of high level strategy to tame the complexity is to use the power of modern HTML and CSS, right? Um, I, I spend a lot of time griping about standards and these days it actually feels like the standards and the browsers are like not just catching up, but they're speeding full steam ahead with brand new platform capabilities. And what they do is they're taking all of these things that you used to have to write a metric ton of JavaScript to do in the browser. Like, you used to have to write JavaScript to center a div. You don't have to do that anymore, <laughs> right? So join me in the anti-JavaScript JavaScript club. You know, I love JavaScript. JavaScript is my favorite programming language, but my favorite thing to do is not write any JavaScript at all and write it in the HTML and CSS, because that's gonna be way more robust and it's gonna be faster. And the thing is like CSS can do amazing things. Like this is pure HTML and CSS, right? Isn't this amazing? Like I mean, Sheen on CodePen, I mean, he's like, this is not our typical use case, let's be honest. But <laughs> it just goes to show the power of the platform and how much it's evolved. Like we couldn't dream of this 20 years ago. We, we would have had to write JavaScript to do this. You don't have to do that anymore. All right, so let's wrap up with um, the thing you probably all came to this talk wanting to know, like wait, Okay, just tell me, what's the right architecture? Um, well, this is where I get to say my favorite line because I am a staff engineer, but it depends. <laughs> right, I love it so much I made this website, ask a staff engineer. Anytime you wanna ask a staff engineer a question, go there and they'll tell you, it depends. Um, <laughs> but the needs of an e-commerce site are gonna be very different than if you're providing software as a service. There's no one size fits all solution. So we need to look at trade-offs. And as always, we start with our users. Think about your user experience. Are you displaying mostly static content so you can render your HTML on the server? Is your content more interactive and task-oriented? So you probably want to look at SSR or a spa. How long is a user typically um, 
having for a session, right? We all want like that sweet, sweet engagement, but realistically, if users typically have very short session lengths, you don't want to waste a whole bunch of time downloading and executing two megabytes of JavaScript. You want to get content to them fast. But if somebody's logging into their account and they're going to perform a bunch of complicated tasks, they're probably going to be better served by a spa. They can handle that, that initial wait. You also have to take into account your business goals when you're deciding on a front end architecture. Right? Where your customer is located and what kind of devices they typically use is going to be a factor. Like if you want to grow a user base in India where most people are on lower powered Android devices, you're gonna to have to care even more about performance. So you, maybe you wanna even look at supporting a progressive web app. SEO for e-commerce and media especially is really big. I mean, let's be honest, SEO is important for everybody. And with the advent of core web vitals, Google search is now taking the performance of your site into account when they do search ranking. So if you're e-commerce, like speed is the name of the game. Um, and finally, it's important to think about what kind of knowledge and experience your team has. Maybe all of your front end engineers already know React, but you're a media company and you're like, oh God, we gotta care about performance now? What do we do? Well, you probably wanna look at SSR. You wanna render your React components on the server and then layer on component islands when you get to the client. Also, think about the size of your platform team, right? If you um, have a smaller team, you're probably better served choosing boring tech. I love, I love that Suhail talked about choosing boring. I mean, I, I work at Etsy, right? Like that's where Choose Boring Tech Club came from. Like I am a team Choose Boring Tech. Um, like, and then, you know, choose things that have a big ecosystem of tools around them. And most importantly, like you don't have to write the documentation. You don't have to have training materials because Stack Overflow exists. <laughs> all right, um, and once you've thought about all of these different factors, then you can make a start on deciding the right architecture. And maybe different parts of your site warrant different architectures. I love this breakdown by Ryan Townsend. Um, he gave this talk just recently called The Unbearable Weight of Massive JavaScript, um, which I love, that's such a great name. <laughs> so he suggests actually using different approaches for different pages in an e-commerce site based on all of these different factors that we've talked about, like static versus dynamic content, SEO, performance, interaction needs. Now, as a platform team, right, the thought of having to support four different architectures, one for each page, is terrifying. <laughs> but, I mean, I would probably turn that on its head and say that figuring out how to build a platform that supports four different rendering patterns and doesn't turn into a giant mess is actually the reason why I became a platform engineer. I love that stuff. Like, yes, give me a system and I will build it and it will be beautiful and everybody else will come in and ruin it, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> all right, so to wrap up, um, so when we started out, a lot of you were thinking this, like the front end is just way too dang complicated. But hopefully I've changed your mind and I've convinced you that the front end is actually solving some of the hardest problems in computer science, like distributed computing and asynchronous IO and not owning the execution environment where your code executes. But the solutions that we have exist for a reason, right? Like CSS, which so many people find frustrating, is actually designed that way for a very good reason. And the, la the main thing I really want you to kind of take out of this is like, you know, focus on core web technologies. Don't get caught up in the framework hype. Like, understand the underlying reasons for the complexity. And thank you very much for having me. Um, that's a QR code that will take you to a whole bunch of links on GitHub. Thank you. <laughs> um, I've been doing web development for quite a long time now as well. And it used to be that every two or three years, it was a new framework and you were going through a bit of a rewrite. Although in the past three or four, maybe five years, it feels like things have slowed down a bit. Mm -hmm. is, is that your experience as well? React's been here for longer than any other framework I could I can recall. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I think, I think React has basically taken over. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why React has, has taken over, you know, it, it, there's a lot of money and a lot, of, a lot of energy from Meta going into shipping React. And I think that we as an industry have this tendency to want to have simple and easy answers. And so use just like everybody uses React, I'm gonna use React, I'm not gonna think about it, that's just the way that everything goes, I think is like an attitude that has cropped up. And I think it's been you know, I mean, it is what it is. Like, I'm a pragmatist. You have to kind of manage it and navigate it. But, but I think that is why we're seeing what we're seeing, and that 
um, you know, a lot like a lot of these newer frameworks and ideas are really designed around taking the core patterns of React and making them faster and kind of working a, around the problems that are inherent in using a SPA framework. Thank you, good question. My, my question is like uh, writing the unit test for command is wrong. So what is your opinion on that? So what, what libraries do you think to write? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, writing unit test mm -hmm. for command is wrong. So what, what is your opinion on that? Um, I am like, I'm a, I will, this is gonna be really controversial, but I don't know, I'm a big fan of integration tests for front ends. <laughs> um, I really like, like behavioral tests, integration tests, because like the worst thing that you can do when you're writing a unit test is to have to like mock out the like APIs that are happening inside of the browser. So I think like right now, the best option that I see for unit tests um, is, um, Oh gosh, it's called React Testing Library, which is more of like a behavioral driven test where you're you're defining more um, like actions that a user is taking in the browser and then looking for the results of that versus like writing a pure unit test. Like you, I mean, let's be honest, like you're you probably are writing very few pure unit tests for your front end interaction code. Like maybe your front end back end code, because there can be front end code in the back end, but um, yeah, so I, I don't know if that's my, that's my spicy hot take. <laughs> um, hi, first of all, that was amazing. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question about sort of bringing this to platform engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, when we think about platforms, it's very often like, how do we Kubernetes, but better? Mm -hmm. um, I feel like we neglect the front end a lot of the time, possibly because a lot of platform engineers just really don't understand the computer. Um, <laughs> What are, we, what are we missing? How can platform works really uh, accelerate transformations and make your lives less uh, terrible? <laughs> yeah, well, I think, um, and apologies, Tanya, because I think that you need to learn about it, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's be honest, like, like I have, I, I will say like in, in all of my years as a front end platform engineer, like sometimes I report to the infrastructure org, sometimes I report to the UX org, sometimes I report to product, like nobody knows what to do with us. I think because the code that we write and the problems that we're solving span across this entire distributed system of all of these web browsers and all of our servers and all of the different bits and pieces. And I think that um, like, you know, we tend, people tend to think that front end engineering is not as cool or like, <laughs> you know, we don't, we sure as hell don't get paid as much as regular, as like back end engineers do. So, so I don't know. I think I, that was, I, I think, and I hope that, especially now that like JavaScript is kind of everywhere, that um, platform teams are going to have to learn about it a lot more and learn how to support it. And, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, can you think of any times, uh, can you describe them to us, where you've been uh, tempted or decided to put things into your platform abstraction away from the front end engineers and it hasn't gone well, either because of the leaky abstraction or other reasons? Yeah, totally. Ooh, I have a good one for this, actually. So um, so I was on a design systems team for quite a long time. And so if you don't know what design systems are, like a, the job of a design system is to provide reusable UI components that other engineers can then use to compose. Like they're Lego blocks of UI components, basically. Um, and we noticed this problem where other engineers were like, basically copying and pasting HTML around in all of their um, PHP and mustache views. And what that meant is that every time we had to go in and change a component, like we couldn't find it because maybe they copied and pasted the wrong thing or they modified it a little bit. And so, you know, if we had to fix like the accessibility of something, it would be impossible because there were all these different versions everywhere. And so we created <laughs> this abstraction layer in, um, in our mustache templates that would allow you to reuse components using like a, like a, a shorthand, right? But I think the problem is, is that 
we built this thing to solve our problem, and we didn't explain to engineers well enough why it was gonna solve their problems too. And the adoption of it was like really, really, really low. So what we ended up doing was we ended up talking to a bunch of people and we made a really small change where the default code view in our design system documentation defaulted to showing this pattern. <laughs> and then people were, because people were just copying and pasting the default, right? So people started actually copying and pasting the thing we wanted them to copy and paste. So that made like a really, you know, so I think like the lesson there is kind of like, like meet engineers where they are and, and make sure that you're understanding how they're interacting with your tools and where they're looking at your tools. And then that's gonna allow you to better sell to them why the things that make your life easier also make their lives easier. Thank you, that's a really good question, I appreciate it.